you everyone for joining us um, on. Uh, so I I'm Saurabh Prasad, an associate professor of uh, electrical and computer engineering at the University of Houston. And uh, on behalf of the IEEE GRSS Image Analysis and Data Fusion Committee, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this webinar and to introduce our dis uh, distinguished speaker today. So uh, today we have Dr. Dave, uh, Dave Niyogi, who uh, has many affiliations <laughs> um, and so, so among, among the key ones, I'll, I'll note some. So he's the William Stamps Farish Chair Professor in the School of Geosciences at the University of Texas, Texas at Austin. Uh, he has, in his previous roles, he has been a former Indiana State climatologist and was the most recent chair of the American Meteorological Society Board of Urban Environment. So uh, Dr. Neogi's talk today will be based on, uh, will be around machine learning, computer visualization, and physics-based modeling for urban climate digital twins. So uh, with that, um, I will hand it over to, to you, Dave, uh, and just, just a uh, request for our audience. Uh, we will have a brief question and answer session at the end. So if you could please, if the rest of us can uh, just keep our microphones muted, and then we can come back for questions at the end of the talk. So uh, Dave, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saurabh. And uh, thank you for all of you who are attending and taking time out. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to see you uh, with the way the screen is set up, uh, but I, I, and nor am I able to see the chat. So if there is any question or if there is any uh, thing that is amiss, uh, please let uh, Saurabh or me know and we will uh, uh, address that comment. So I want to start off by, first of all, of course, thanking IEEE and I start, uh, start off by thanking Saurabh for the work that is being done in this topic. And uh, I will like to give you a sense of what we are doing in this whole realm of machine learning and how this aspect of computer visualization and physics-based modeling is being used with the uh, with one specific application or set of applications that come up with the context of uh, uh, what I'll call as uh, the the urban uh, urban uh, modeling or city modeling, city scale modeling for weather and other applications. Now, before I do that, I'll be remiss if I don't acknowledge the uh, the the very comprehensive uh, efforts that have been put in by some of my co-authors uh, over the years, uh, particularly Manmit Singh. Uh, who is also in the audience, um, uh, Harsh Kamat, who is a PhD student, uh, whose work on the global building data sets I'll be talking about, uh, Daniel Aliaga uh, at Purdue, uh, who has been my uh, long-term collaborator for almost 10 to 15 years on a number of projects so that we have been co-developing on this topic, and Zhongliang Yang at uh, UT, uh, with whom we are developing many of the uh, land-based digital twins, uh, Nachika Tacharya, who is at NOAA now and with whom we have been working with some of the statistical downscaling aspects and so forth. But over a period of time, the applications that have started coming up are really from the context of the community that we work with. So I'm going to touch on four specific aspects and uh, uh, I'm going to try and also keep an eye on the time. So first, we'll start looking into the context of cities, the evolution of the science of understanding that we have with reference to the problem we are looking at, some of the activities that are going on within the domain, and uh, the role of AIML digital twins, which I'll be calling as DTs, and the need for foundational as well as usable science that is integrating the different disciplines in this particular problem. So that's the four aspects I'll go with. So... The core aspect of why we are doing this is that cities are important. I mean, cities, as you know, many of us are probably logged into this particular city with regard to this particular webinar from a city. And uh, we are aware that cities are, first of all, extremely good sources of socioeconomic development. Uh, the investments typically put into a city provide a, a 10 times uh, outcome. So the returns of investments are to the order of one is to 10. And one of the reasons cities have been growing quite substantially globally. And uh, 
cities, as they are growing with the influx of humans, with the influx of the infrastructure development, are also going through some unprecedented stress. And uh, the unprecedented stress is not just in the context of the growth in the infrastructure stress, but it is also in the context of the external forcing, such as like, for instance, in Austin, we had heat waves or we have had ice storms, uh, some things which have not been so routinely happening before. So this is the new regime of environmental stressors that are coming onto the, on the cities. Now, when you think of a city, you should not think of it as a monolithic unit that is represented often. And it is a very living entity with lots of moving parts. So when we say we are redesigning city, it is not like we only have the opportunity with the old, the newer cities, but there's also components of the older city which are being constantly updated. Infrastructure growth is a very living problem. And so within that infrastructure growth, within the aspect of redesigning city or city aspect, people are looking at climate solutions because nearly by some measures, third to half of greenhouse emissions come from city, even though they might be just tiny specks on the whole globe. A majority of our greenhouse gases come from the city. Secondly, many of the changes that we are seeing in the city, which are already warmer than the surrounding area, and I'll show you some examples, means that we can look at cities at what a future warmer world would be. And so they are a good harbinger of how the future climate aspect could be in terms of the impact it has on our health, on the ecosystem, on the energy use and so forth. And this is where we are also looking at a multitude of solutions. So you have a very nice constrained environment of a small domain where you can test out different things and then hopefully replicate them in other cities in terms of developing solutions for a better livable, uh, more sustainable planet. Uh, and it starts with one city and one neighbor at a point. So some of the problems that we are clearly aware of in terms of city is the first one is the sprawl. Uh, the land use in cities has been dramatically changing, not just in cities. It's not like cities are just vertically growing. They're encroaching on the landscape nearby. And as a result of that, the land use is dramatically changing. We are seeing urban sprawl. Related with the sprawl are the emissions which go into the context of creating poor air quality also have an impact on health and other aspects. And then, of course, there's a cascade of extremes that start coming up with regards to some of the flooding, uh, some of the uh, hazards associated with heat and so forth. So these aspects are not unusual. I mean, even though I show a specific example, these are very generic and they can be true of almost all major cities, unfortunately. So before I go further, let us look into this question of what is a city? So the first impression that we get when we look at a city is something which is like a New York skyline or a Chicago skyline or a Mumbai skyline, uh, where you have a range of buildings all coming together. And then you have this cascade of concrete infrastructure that is all around you, a, a human infrastructure that is around you. And there is a limited footprint when you have that vision of what a city ought to be. But if you look at where people live, when they say, I live in a city, it is not necessarily at the most concentrated high-rise building areas. Very often, people are sprawled around the city, and so the infrastructure and resources are over a much larger area. So the footprint associated with a city is over a much wider domain when you start looking at the mobility and the manner in which people start moving in. Now, if you look at the impacts associated with the city, uh, some of the emissions, some of the pollutants that release, that footprint is over a much larger period and over a large, much larger region. And so the footprint associated with what is a city will depend on the application you're looking at. From a very energy use perspective, it could be much more of a constrained concrete infrastructure. From a mobility and greenhouse emission perspective, it could be at a much larger perspective. And then from the context of emissions and impact, it could be even larger network and footprint that we are looking at. So the definition of city is really important. So in India, for instance, we are trying to study this with the context of a urban uh, um, um, 
climate program, urban air quality, hydrology, and uh, extremes that has been studying. And uh, Akshara Kaginakar at CDAC, she is the program director for that, and she's the PI on that. And this is a, a framework as to how we are studying this, say, for instance, in India, or how we are studying it in the United States with what we have, the Department of Energy's urban field labs, where we are studying, say, Austin, Baltimore, Chicago, and a few other locations like in Arizona and so forth. The context typically is you study temperature and you temperature, study the rainfall extremes in trying to understand the range of impacts that come up associated with the city and then the pathways, which could be through emissions, defining of the urban infrastructure and the definition of what an infrastructure would be. So this is the framework of the problem that we have right now. Cities which are growing, cities which have a variable footprint and cities which have a need for integration of different disciplinary knowledge to start developing information that policymakers can use to try and design uh, future cities. Here's an example of one of the uh, uh, west eastern coast of India, southern eastern coast of India, a dramatic change in the city of uh, Chennai uh, in terms of the footprint associated with it and how the land cover has changed. And in more recent years, there have been flooding and there have been questions about whether the infrastructure change in terms of the more impervious area has contributed to the implicate uh, to, uh, to the localized flooding that has been happening in the city. So the range of impacts are being translated within the policymakers and the citizens perspective of what is happening around them rather than just in a larger global context of a climate change. And this is where we have the opportunity to start studying this problem and providing some very localized information that we can start and tease out the impact of local scale, larger scale, and trying to develop solutions which could be at a much localized scales. Some of the well-known impacts of cities, of course, are associated with the urban heat island. Uh, here you see a satellite imagery, which is a landsat temperature, uh, and the red spots, the warmer colors, implicate the city as being warmer than the surrounding area. And because they look like an island, they are often called as an urban heat island. So this is a couple of cities uh, in Ahmedabad and Delhi, I believe, that you can see that the region is much warmer than the surrounding area. And this is a retrieved from the modest land surface temperature. So this is one example of the well-known effect of city. The second well-known effect of city is that once you have warming associated with the city, coming because of radiation coming in and infrastructure that is in the city, heating up the environment, you start creating a framework of urban dome, which could have pollutants sitting in it. You could have circulation coming as a result of that. So because the cities start getting warmer, the central pressure goes down. And then you could have winds coming from the side, almost like a sea breeze, and that can create a zone of convergence. So when you have this zone of convergence, then you could have convection because the air starts rising up and create clouds and the environmental changes in uh, regards to the heating of the city. So there is the infrastructural aspect, which is the physical characteristics of the city. And then there are dynamical changes, which are transient in terms of how city is evolving. And so that changes the rainfall, that changes the amount of features that are uh, affected with regards to the dynamic setup associated with the city. So you can see this in sort of this cartoon where you can see the city getting warmer as the uh, day goes. You have moisture and winds coming in, then clouds forming and downwind of the city. Now you have moisture and more energetic clouds creating the environment. So this we know. And in fact, we have studied this globally for a range of uh, uh, cases and where we have found that this feature can be noted where cities are not just changing temperature, changing the environment around it, changing the rainfall in and around the city. Now, given this framework, we have also found that there is things like, you know, the effect of local changes like pollution, the vehicular emission patterns, and all of that translates in terms of the larger scale changes in and around the city, when it rains, where it rains, how much it rains, which part of the city you get more heat exposure and so forth. So the point I'm conveying is that the design of a city has a deep impact 
in the manner in which our larger climate change is going to be faced and impacted the resources, hum, uh, human experiences, as well as the infrastructural changes that, that can happen. So the question that comes up is, can we then design cities to get the desired climate? I mean, I give an example of say about 40 years back, if you're buying a car, it was okay to have a car which did not have air conditioning in it. You could roll down the window and you could get air, natural ventilation. Nowadays, almost always you'll buy a car which has air conditioning built into it. Now, I'm not talking about cities which will have air conditioners as a dome over it, but we have a possibility that we can start looking at cities where we are conditioning the climate we want in terms of how the ventilation is taking place, in terms of the, where the green infrastructure is, where we have emissions, where do you have the carbon sinks, where do you have the ability to retain water, and so forth. So this climate-conditioned cities are really happening and a reality going forward. And how do we use the city knowledge to sort of improve the predictions of urban extremes? Like given the idea that what we do in the city changes our heat, changes our rainfall, our extremes, what can we do in terms of improving this prediction? Those have been some of the questions people have been looking at when they try to look at the city in the context of making it a more resilient city. That how do you use technology to make city more effectively resilient, more livable, and just more uh, smarter in the context of that. And this is where we start looking in data and data resources. Now, when you start thinking of city and we can do a data-driven solution, one very important thing to understand is that most of the cities don't have the data that we need for designing the environment and the infrastructure plans for the city. Nearly 80 to 90% of the human population lives in towns, which are very small towns and very small cities. So when you think of cities, I showed you first picture where it was like the New York downtown area and so forth. Some of the large cities have this data, but not majority of it. So how can we get information on cities and blend them into our weather and climate model to develop our city scale understanding that is one of the core question that we are trying to address when you look at it in the context of making global solutions rather than some very place-based case studies, which can show that we are trying to make the uh, city a better place. And that becomes the framework. So what do we have at hand when we are trying to create such data sets? The first and foremost is you know, uh, satellite data sets. Satellites have been wonderful. They can give us not only the infrastructural data but you also have information about things like the population, which means it tells a bit more about human dynamics. You also have information about some of the non-urban features, such as the uh, elevation data set, the vertical structure of the environment, and not just the 2D structure associated with the landscape. And then you can look at this data at multiple scales, uh, globally to at a very narrow neighborhood scale in terms of understanding what sort of features exist in the given domain. So one feature that has been very popularly now being used by the community is something known as a World Urban Data Analysis and uh, Portal Tool or WoodApt. Uh, we have been one of the core team developers for this and this WoodApt data set, essentially what it does, it takes the Google Earth, OpenStreetMap, Landsat imagery, and it reclassifies it with respect to the cities and then there are some local surveys and verification that can be done where people have gone and taken pictures or they have some done some crowdsourcing and identified the veracity of the outcome. And these maps are now becoming available to the broader community. For instance, uh, speaking of India, we did this Buddha uh, Atlas with over 100 plus cities that was uh, done a few years back. Uh, in almost everywhere now, every major city, we now have a WoodApp map. And more recently, WoodApt has been used in the global climate model in terms of how it is trying to uh, be representing cities with the landscape. So what is the implication of that? Uh, now I'm going to show you some examples which are not always from the United States because very often people think we already have the data here. Why are we validating it against that thing? So I'm showing it for places where we may or may not have data. So one such example is this case of uh, Mumbai, which is a city, as you know, west on the western coast of India. And what has been unique about Mumbai is 
it has been seeing some exceptional urban flooding in the recent years. Uh, the most uh, well-known flood was a 2005 case, July 26, 2005, which caused almost like uh, 60 inches of rain in a single day. That is like, you know, one whole year's rain occurring within one day. So this was highly concentrated. So there has been a perception and understanding that has been shown by a number of studies that urbanization has had an impact on this kind of a uh, urban rainfall uh, modification. So if you look at this WUDAP data that we have created, you can see that our current climate or weather models will look a little different in terms of the physics that is being used for simulating the energy balance for these models. So you see these two maps uh, on left and right. And there was a, a PhD student, Pratiman Patel, who did this as part of his initial work when he was visiting our group. And uh, this work, he shows that you actually have two very different kind of landscapes that start emerging in terms of how the uh, model will start looking at it, whether you're using a modest data set or a WODAP-based uh, outcome. What is the implication of this? The implication is that in the manner of how the city gets represented, it has changes in how the uh, rainfall is simulated by the model, and you start getting things which are much more closer to observation. Now, when you're trying to look at this data in a more broader context across different region, you can see that you have four to five different problems that start emerging. You could go with something like planet data, planet labs, and you could get some limited data, but there's a still missing data for some of the larger cities. You could get invest some resources and start getting some medium quality details from looking at LIDAR and so forth. You could do some drone-based aerial surveys or have our LIDARs, and you could have some very intensive observations and get some high details, but with a very low coverage area. And then you could have the open street maps, which could give you a much larger uh, perspective of a detailed and so forth. So these are necessarily uh, part of where we are in terms of the uncertainties and scarcities of the different data that we have currently. Now, what has been doing, we have been doing then is using procedural modeling and using this procedural model, we are as the uh, going with the context of uh, creating digital twin cities. So here's an example of where the procedural models and visualization techniques have been used to create something, say, for New Orleans. And uh, you can see what has been created by the model. And on the right side, you are seeing the Google uh, Earth aerial imagery to try and see how the landscape is uh, developed using the... Uh, the visualization-based procedural model and reality. Uh, here's an example of uh, Dublin, for instance, that you can see from the uh, visualization-based procedural model that is being done in Aliaga's lab with what is in the Google Earth model uh, uh, data engine that we have. And so point is, using some of this data, you can start putting them into visualization tools and create your own uh, data sets of what could be synthetic data sets of cities using very limited information that is available. Now, given that, you can then start pulling that information into a much more localized scale and not just have this Google Earth kind of imagery, which already exists. So one way of which we have been doing is using uh, video gaming and computer visualization uh, and computer graphics tools. So here's one example how this is done. You have this terrain, that terrain can be developed into roads, roads can be developed into parcels, and parcels can be developed then into buildings. And this is all either done by providing this information as a series of sequence, or this could be done much more interactively by providing information on what is the uh, agent-based approach of how the city is growing, what the economy is changing, how population is changing, what is our energy demand and so forth. Uh, we have Zoltan Nagy in um, the audience uh, who also does some really remarkable work on this agent-based aspects of energy use and so forth. And so you could do this with the context of, you know, uh, building a framework of the city uh, of how it is. So there was this, uh, so if you want more details, there is a paper that has just come out in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Nexus, PNAS Nexus issue. Uh, which looks at deep learning and how this framework is used by looking at satellite imagery and segmentation and creating images, which can then be used within the weather and climate models for creating the scenario. So for instance, on the right side at the bottom, you see 
This is the city of Chicago. And you can see the procedural model-based creation of a city map versus what you see from the Google Earth imagery. So there's a high degree of uh, similarity. The question you might ask, if you already have Google Earth, why do we still need to do this? And that's a good question. And the reason we do this is that we can query what we create from the procedural model by zooming in and out as if we are flying a drone into that particular city in a very digital manner. So that allows us to measure digitally what is the width of the city, what is the height of the buildings, what is the layout, what is the framework going in. And this is all being computer generated. So you have the data pixelated that you can query and get that information. Now, given that data, you can then start putting that into your environmental models as if this was coming from a LIDAR or satellite and then simulate the environment. And here we show that this is uh, to orient you that loop you see the north of that is the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan, and south of that loop is where you have Chicago. So the city of Chicago, and I'm showing the city of Chicago because we have a very nice field experiment going on there called Crocus. Uh, this is a five-year Department of Energy Urban Integrated Field Lab on uh, climate studies, that urban studies that we are doing for climate resiliency. And uh, you can see that when we are using this machine-generated landscape, it still has as good or if not better fields with regards to as if this was being generated by humans. Now you can use this information for creating if-then scenarios. Here's an example of what it would be if you're trying to green a part of city. This is Indianapolis at the center, that's Indiana. So left of Indianapolis is on left and north uh, would be Chicago. Uh, so what you see here is with regards to how parts of greening could be done, whether it is to the north of the city, south of the city, what it could do in terms of the temperature changes, humidity changes, rainfall changes that we can simulate and show it to the policymakers. You could also ask some questions with regards to optimizing that if I want to put some roofing, which is white, or if I want to put some sort of a green landscape, where should I place it such that it can create the kind of environment I want? Do you remember the climate conditioning I was talking about? This is one example of it that I want to reduce the temperature, I want to improve some vis uh, the ventilation, where should the city plan these things? And then there are, of course, some local skill issues that they have to look at, but at least this gives you an idea of saying, I want to change a city versus go to the northern part of the city or the southern part of the city. And then you start looking into the context of other things. You could ask other inverse problems, like what would you do to reduce flooding? Would it mean that you are putting more a sponginess in the city, so to say, by putting more vegetation? Do you open up the streets? Do you make taller buildings? What will you do in terms of changing the flood potential? So you're able to ask this if-then questions again with regards to what you can do now with this visualized aspect of the city. Now, when I talk of flooding, one of the key questions that comes up and this exemplifies in the context of flooding is that we often have the footprint of the city but we don't have data about the height of the buildings and the 3D structure of the city. And so this is where we have been developing. Uh, uh, so one of the uh, students, Harsh Kamat, as part of his PhD, we're working with Manmeet and a few others. They have been developing what we call the first global uh, building height data set for urban studies. So this is a global building height data set. You're taking the satellite data set from the ALOS data, the building footprint data, running it through the unit uh, machine learning kind of framework, and then creating a digital map of a very high resolution building height data set openly available to create our uh, digital twin of building. So this is equivalent to create a LIDAR data, but all openly available for hundreds of cities across the globe. So right now we are working with you know, uh, cities in US and other place. So how good is this? So here's an example of the Globus, which is the global uh, building studies for our uh, building height for urban studies data set. The example of what it is from a LIDAR for city of Austin or city of Chicago and what the globus output is. And you can see there is a very high degree of agreement in the manner in which we are synthetically able to create the building height data as well for the thing. Now, why is this important? The importance is that it is not just the building height data, but the ability to make this data more communicable with the kind of environmental models we have. So here, for instance, we can look at the building height, we can look at the plan area. Uh, we have Alberto Martili, uh, who is one of the co-developer of this model, visiting 
uh, as a Fulbright Fellow in our lab uh, recently, as well as at Arizona State. And so working with Alberto, we are trying to interface this with the, with the, the WERF model, the weather research forecast model, which many in the community use right now, and create this kind of infrastructure where we are not just creating a map, where we are not just creating a building, but we are actually creating parameters that go in terms of developing the simulations that are required for these models going forward. So here's an example of that, where we are simulating a heat island in Austin by using the building height data set. And here we show that the observations, which are from LIDAR or the wood app, which is the Landsat 2D imagery without looking at the 3D structure, and what we can do with Globus is all comparable with, of course, Globus being as good as a LIDAR. So it really shows the value of putting this kind of information in trying to understand the heat and the impact of heat and so forth. So when we are doing work related to say the energy use or in terms of the impacts of heating, we can now identify the vulnerability of regions much more cleaner. So right now there is an effort going on between our lab and with Aliagas, where we are looking at over 330 cities across US where the population is less than uh, 100,000 and so forth, it should be less than. Um, and here we are creating this data, both in terms of the height, in terms of the layout and the structure that can be used for studying different kinds of problems. Now, what is the opportunity going on that? In the last 10 minutes, I'll try to get into a different gear of work. Now, one aspect of deep learning and machine learning has, of course, been creating this data set, which are part of WERF or the climate modeling uh, studies, more dynamical models. A second kind of requirement that cities often have is that you have information which is available from satellite or radar or something which is at a larger resolution, say typically a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid or a five kilometer by five kilometer grid. And the requirement is that we often want this information at a very local scale. You want the temperature at in your neighborhood, not at the airport. You want rainfall in parts of the city, not across the city, because that's how you're going to create the, uh, the studies and in terms of adaptation solutions for these kind of problems. So one example that we have created is a deep learning based container that is uh, looking at a data set of maps as a, a visual tool and then using image processing using SRCNN and creating very high resolution downscale product typically to the tune of about 300 meter without having to go through a dynamical uh, downscaling framework for this kind of work. So the downscaling framework using statistical technique, using uh, CNN kind of approaches, this is a very popular approach that is now emerging in terms of the downscale world. This is not just with regards to what is happening with current data set, but we are also applying this with regards to future climate projections. So Manmeet, for instance, has been working with us in developing the Austin's future climate projections using at all the CIMIP-6 climate output, which is you know 50 plus simulations. And they are at 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer grid. And how do you bring it down to a very local scale such that the city managers can start doing some decisions? This kind of work can be done again with regards to using this machine learning kind of approaches, using the SRCNN kind of approaches and creating high resolution data sets and almost putting it into a framework that is reproducible and usable by other cities and doesn't require the kind of efforts we have put in for just Austin. Here's one example of a uh, temperature data set that has been ground to it to bring it down to few meters, hundreds of meters, rather than the very large 10 kilometer grid that we have for temperature and rainfall that can be done. So we have this ability by using SRCNN and some other frameworks to downscale the information. What is the value of such a downscale information? Here's the same rainfall event that occurred. If you looked at data, which was at five kilometer resolution versus something that is now generated at a 300 meter. So a very high degree of understanding about which are the areas where it is raining more versus less and so forth. Uh, this is uh, a more recent uh, studies that Manmeet has been leading and you see the variability that emerges in, in terms of the data. I want to change the gears a little bit. And then if you focus now as the value of this machine learning, deep learning based approaches, what are some of the things that people have been doing? 
So one example of that was using the visual, visualization approach. The another framework that we have been doing has been working with this belief network, taking reanalysis products, taking remote sense data, and creating a learning framework to downscale that information at a very high scale. So this is a typical framework that is being done. So we now have 500 meter resolution, multi-year data sets of air temperature, for instance, that are over Austin and uh, uh, Wuhan and other uh, places that we have been doing with our collaborators. So this is one example, very routinely done. Temperature is a good example of that can have. Uh, it's a continuous field. So that's where we test out few things. Another one that has been very interesting has been using a deep learning framework with soil and other covariances, vegetation and other covariances to create soil moisture data set. Now, soil moisture is a very difficult parameter because it depends on soil. It depends. It's a, it has a temporal characteristic. It has a vegetation characteristic, the impact aspect. And so we have created this data fusion approach by which you now have one meter, 30 meter land surface temperature and one kilometer based, uh, very high resolution soil moisture data for a very large region that can be continually built by looking at the uh, existing satellite data products, but running them through a deep learning framework. Uh, an even more advanced version of that, we have done as a one kilometer data fusion, which is over the Midwest and other region. And we've shown that this is uh, space and uh, spatially invariant. You can actually use this framework where you have different satellite tools, existing precipitation data sets, and run it through a deep learning framework and generate very high resolution continuous soil moisture data set. Soil moisture and rainfall, I keep referring because they are two very difficult to simulate parameters even in a dynamical model. And so when we show, show our ability to simulate these, then we mean it means that we have high confidence and that process has gone through a lot of vetting. So this can be considered a mature result in which we have the ability to take this down for soil moisture, rainfall, and other factors. An even more interesting thing that is now emerging is to look at it in a predictive sense. So what we are doing here is that given the fact that we can recreate the soil state, we can create the environmental state, and we have some idea about a future upcoming season, what would it mean in the context of energy use or what it would mean in terms of crop yield and so forth. And that's the hybrid learning approach that we are developing, where we are taking more of what we know with a limited knowledge of the future and then creating a future scenario of variables that are of interest. So we are not just talking about it will be warmer or wetter. We are talking about what it would mean for energy use or what it would mean in terms of the agricultural output uh, that is expected. Now, where is all this going in terms of the world that we are uh, living in? One of the big investments that have come from European Union have been this a multi-billion dollar effort over multi in the coming years and decades known as Destination Earth. Or this product is known as Destiny. This Destiny is going to be the first digital twin of the entire global forecast system that has been done as a very massively machine learning a data science based approach for creating future climate as well as current state of global state. So there have been some really nice papers, you can read them about how a digital twin for Earth can be developed, both in the context of looking at forecasting and in the context of a future climate change. So this is a long term effort that is now underway at a very global context. So the other way in which machine learning data sciences is being used now is looking at this from the forecast perspective. And so I'll show you a couple of examples of the work that we have been doing with regards to capturing this particular thing. So the starting point of that has been some work that has been done in the University of Washington where they created uh, a deep learning network uh, for taking the global fields and then looking at, it's a very simple problem. You take the global fields and you take one particular variable and you try to simulate that variable for the future with a different time. And they've shown that this works pretty well. So that team has worked and developed this little more in terms of looking at the global context by how do you make it as a part of the global sphere and so forth, and not just have it as a small domain, but at a global domain. 
Uh, we have worked on this problem a bit more by taking off uh, uh, the distortion that might occur because of a globe. How do you take these images? And the idea essentially is that you create a deep learning framework and taking grids across the globe and then tying those grids together in creating a global picture of what is emerging with regards to different variables. So it, prior work has been for one variable. Now we are doing it for multiple variables, temperature, rainfall, not just temperatures and so forth. And so this uh, particular one, we have had a couple of uh, uh, papers on this. You can take a look at it at the new IPS as well as on ECMWF uh, uh, machine learning workshop that can go more into the details of how this is being done. But essentially, you train the model on hindcast and then train, apply it for the future. The question that comes up is, are these models, first of all, capable of simulating reality? And second, can they capture extremes which may or may not be in the training data set? Those were the two main questions that emerged. And the answer is, yes, these models are able to replicate the simulations of global reality in terms of a forecast with at least as good a skill of what it would take in terms of a very complex dynamical model which requires thousands of GPU hours in trying to create it. The statistical model, when well-trained, can be done in a matter of minutes to give you a global forecast output that comes up. The second question was, can it capture the extremes? So remember I told you about that 60 odd inches rain that occurred in one day. So here's an example of that extreme rainfall event in Mumbai and where you can see that this kind of a trained model can capture this very localized event as well in terms of how the system has emerged. Not just in Mumbai, it can look at something more like a central flood in uh, Europe, which is over a much wider region and more dynamically spreading. It could capture that too. What is more interesting that we are studying now as part of a DOE project in creating a digital twin for the Gulf region is it can capture hurricanes and the manner in which the rainfall is emerging. And so there is a tremendous potential for these kind of simplified machine learning approaches that are well-trained and developed with a network for creating future state and they have high potential going forward. Now, given the fact that we say we are able to do this, the question comes up, how do you know what it is doing? How do you know how it is being trained? And that goes into the context of what we call the explainability of this uh, techniques or explainable AI. So there is a causal pack being created and, and I've been interested in this whole topic of causality for a long time. And um, uh, with Manmeet, we are now creating this causal pack, uh, which is 70 plus algorithms that might be available for using the different uh, uh, tools of understanding how the system is varying, what it is doing in terms of the, uh, the causal linkages. One good example of this has been a recent study that we have been doing over the last uh, year or so in trying to understand the impact of aerosols, impact of droughts, impact of rain and land use in the manner in which the South Asian monsoon has been changing. And we have been looking at it in terms of the causal mechanisms that what is happening within the model to try and develop a better understanding. So it is not just within the context of what is happening with regards to the, uh, the machine learning approaches, but this kind of approaches could also be used for studying the more traditional dynamical tools, but extracting new knowledge out of it. So it has a, a value in both ways. Uh, if you are interested in these kind of work, I want to highlight a few things that are coming up as I'm coming towards closing. Uh, first is National Academies just recently has had a digital twins workshop on atmospheric climate and sustainability studies. That workshop and its report should be available. And if not, it should be available very soon. At, um, NS, uh, at, uh, at uh, UT, University of Texas, we have an upcoming uh, atmospheric and Urban Digital Twin workshop that we'll be developing. In fact, Zoltan Nagy uh, is a PI for that project. And we will be pulling this information uh, from the community to try and develop a synthesis document. And if this is a type of work that is of interest, uh, please get in touch with me. Uh, with the World Climate Research Program, there is a Digital Earth uh, Lighthouse activity. And under that, we have just recently started a urban digital twin framework. 
and uh, uh, if there is interest i can i can call it those name and that name those names go to a different committee and then they will select few names but we would very much welcome uh, a diverse input for this kind of topic going forward so in closing i'll say that we are going through some very exciting era in atmospheric urban digital twin kind of studies where we are now using vision algorithms artificial intelligence machine learning which seemed like a very different topic few years back becoming part of the mainstream in the manner in which our forecasting or development of models and the whole decision framework is emerging. If you asked me about 10 years back, whether I'll be working on this topic, I would have said, these are great topics, but I don't think they are going to be in our realm, but I think they are very much here. Um, what I want to highlight is that we have this very nice group at University of Texas, and we are developing the first academia led atmospheric urban digital twin that can be multi-scale for creating that. And I say that because this is not going to be done just by few of us here. This is a collaborative community effort and we welcome your participation in how do we do this. One of which, as I mentioned, is this National Science Foundation's Atmospheric and Urban Digital Twin Workshop that will be happening. Another is the World Climate Research Program's uh, Lighthouse Activity uh, Under Digital Earth that I'm, uh, I'm leading that I, I welcome your uh, participation in. But broadly speaking, that Earth system models will start having many such digital twin machine learning AI based inputs in coming years. And uh, that that's just the uh, writing on the wall at this stage that especially as we saw with regards to what we saw with the video gaming and the manner in which we could interface that with our real weather forecast this meta world of what is virtual and what is real data versus what it means from it really affecting us, that boundary is blurring quite a bit. And so this aspect of living the future, this aspect of creating our future is possible because if you can almost create it digitally, there's a high likelihood you can create it in reality. So very simple questions like, where do we want to plant trees if you want to make cities more climate ready? Or how should we use satellite data to create health studies such that you know people can understand which neighborhoods are more health and um, uh, uh, other vulnerabilities that we should look into? Uh, those could be done. In terms of a more challenging problems, one of our aspects right now is we don't have a very good sense of the uncertainty that we are introducing when you have such kind of uh, introduction of different data sets in terms of the output. A, a, a high resolution image is high resolution, but that doesn't mean high precision. It could just mean that you now have things and more details, but it is also likely that when you start using information at that detail, you can increase the uncertainty. So how do you start using this kind of information and what do you do? Those will be the kind of things we'll, we'll have to study. So I'll stop there and I thank you for, uh, um, patiently listening to what I was saying. Thanks. And I want to again acknowledge uh, all my wonderful co-authors whose uh, work I have been really highlighting here. And uh, it has been a pleasure to really just understand this very new field. Uh, and, and, and I came in pretty skeptically in terms of what could be the value of this in terms of a more physics-driven dynamical modeling framework that we all work with that has been more of my comfort zone. Uh, but as you now see, having worked in it for a few years, I have really started becoming a big proponent that we should do more of this. And I welcome uh, your suggestions, ideas, and opportunities to work with you. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dave, for that exciting talk. That was, that was truly interesting. So um, we'd like to open the floor for questions from the audience. Um, I, I see some questions coming through in chat. Uh, so maybe I can start with one of those. Uh, so Sudhir uh, asked earlier during your talk, uh, this pertains to uh, your building footprint extraction. Uh, if you did any, um, let me see. So I, I believe so. Did you, did, did you do your own building footprint extraction and how does it accuracy compares with standard methods and uh, what's the theory behind determining building height from satellite images so that's yeah so first is you can use OpenStreetMap 
but you may or may not always have open street map in all places with the same accuracy. And it is you sort of have pretty good feel for Landsat and other data sets that are now coming. EcoStress is one I would recommend. Uh, and several more. Planet Planet.com has Planet Lab has some data as well. Given the fact that so many data exist, and given the fact that they can be now integrated with Quick GIS or some other data sources, a, a processing framework, you can create your own building footprint models. Now the question comes up is, are you looking at a building or are you looking at a parcel where you have the road and other networks? So it depends on the kind of question you ask and how you're going to validate it. So short answer is you can, if the open source data are available, start using that first, see if it serves your purpose. If not, then start looking into the context of creating it with your own data set. Now, the second question was, what is the satellite to building height? Now, in fact, satellite data have some LiDAR information built into it. Uh, you also have the digital terrain model that comes very routinely from different satellite products. So it is just a matter of reprocessing them and then calibrating them against existing LiDAR data set. And many of those places you have this LiDAR data set to so ver verify and develop this kind of a deep learning framework such that the knowledge you have from few can be applied to many by developing some functional relationships. That is the idea behind any statistical relation that you have, that you create some tools, you create some understanding for few locations using satellite data and localized information and you create a generalized model which can be applied to other locations where you get the satellite data, but you may not have the benefit of having the in-situ observations. And so that is the logic behind using satellite data set. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? You can feel free to unmute your microphone and ask. I think a number of you are asking if this this presentation can be accessed and yes so, of course uh, this is I, being I, recorded i believe yes so we will be uploading this to the ieee grss youtube to channel so you, you will shortly see it it'll show up there yeah i just noticed another question about whether this can be applied for agriculture well absolutely i mean the information i showed for agriculture in terms of soil moisture the information you get for temperature or rainfall all of these are very important input for developing crop yield and agriculture and so forth. And um, it's um, definitely something that can be done. One important area when you start looking in terms of developing models, which are for a specific stakeholder, whether it is city or agriculture or so forth, to, is to understand we can replicate the physical characteristics very well but it is a human dynamics, which is still very much the big unknown. And by human dynamics, I mean, within a city, it is things like the traffic pattern. Within agriculture, it is things which are like locally done by humans to rectify a situation. For instance, if there is a drought, people are not going to just do business as usual. They are going to do things differently. They will plant seeds at a different location. They might use a different planting date. So this human management decisions are a bit of a invariant and uh, a, a bit of a variant, and they will need to be embedded with more of the static understanding that we have. So that's the only caution I will use when we say we can use this. Okay, I see a few more questions show up. Mm -hmm. uh, so a question about how cities create their own local climate and contribute to global change. Uh, there are a number of uh, studies and papers out there, Samiran. Uh, and even at the start of my talk, I showed you how urban heat island and how the changes in the rainfall occur as a result of that. Uh, the most common one is known as the urban heat island, which is the cities are warmer than the surrounding area. The more broader aspect is associated with like, say, aerosol emissions of pollution and rainfall and convection. And there are a number of studies and your uh, if you send an email to either of us, we'll be happy to share those. I have a uh, question about, uh, I mean, so I found the gamification work really intriguing, right? So I'm, I'm wondering, is there, and it's probably difficult to do this, but is there some way you can validate some of those 
uh, game plans, like uh, if 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 then scenarios, right? But because uh, it'll always give you some out- output. But like, how do we uh, yeah. how do we ascribe some level of confidence to yeah. what's no, going on? Uh, one of the big uh, uncertainties about a future is we don't know what is really going to happen. I mean, we have good ideas. Uh, so one good way to do that is to actually ask people that what with their best knowledge that they have as experts, what they would have done. And if a system is able to create something which is supporting that, then that is valuable. But what is even more valuable is that in doing so, there's an anomaly that can be detected. This is the whole basis of say what we call the mutual information, that when something which is anomalous and providing that, and then they can rethink on that process, that could be of value. So it is not necessarily only verification per se, but it is also providing scenarios that experts can think of, that's one. Now the second part of verification is that even though we may not be able to verify greening or building and so forth, the physical aspects, we can verify the net impact emerging from it, meaning things like changes in temperature, changes in rainfall for a short period of time. And so as long as the trajectory of the change and the pathways of change that we are thinking of are fine, we can extrapolate that. Another way verification is being done is we actually do crowdsourcing. So what we have done, for instance, in Austin is we had community events and where we asked community members to come and put on maps, locations they think are very hot, very comfortable, uncomfortable around the neighborhoods. And they have put some stickers on it. And then this is treating humans as a sensors. And then we have done downscaling using machine learning where you can say, what do we capture? And so this is another way where we are comparing the output, even if we don't have data, but we all feel heat and we can verify that. So that's another way we have been doing it. That's interesting. All right. There's, uh, I don't know how much we don't want to hold you back too long, but there are some more questions coming in, Mm -hmm. in chat. Uh, And of course, if anybody feels to, I mean, just just wants to chime in, feel free to unmute and, and ask. So there's one question about any plugin that is being created for building energy modeling. Uh, Zoltan Negi, who is here, um, is in fact an expert on those kind of studies. And uh, we have another student, Ting Yu, uh, who has been working with me and Zoltan. And we did this kind of study for COVID under the energy use during COVID. So we were very fortunate that Austin Energy gave us about uh, hundreds of thousands of data points of energy use all anonymous, so we don't know who, what, where, but this kind of data for studying uh, these aspects, but you can bring it down to even finer scale. And Zoltan has some of the data sets and models and expertise, and we will be definitely going along those points. But if you're interested, please to follow up with me and uh, uh, Dr. Nagy, NAGY, Zoltan Nagy, he's in the audience too. Any other questions? Uh, if not, I, I really thank you, um, Dave, for this uh, truly ex- exciting talk. And, uh, and we thank the audience for, um, for joining us today. So. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And I also see Jim Garrison joining in, who has been doing some remarkable work with Soil Moisture and others. So hopefully he will be talking at some point using what he has been doing with remote sense data and soil moisture and downscaling and upscaling on that. But again, I thank you, Saurabh, and I triple E for- um, uh, Excuse me, sir. Mm-hmm. Uh, am I audible? Yep. Yes. Uh, so can I ask a doubt? Uh, there is a wonderful presentation. I have a mm-hmm. doubt, actually. Uh, when we are defining this land use, land cover data sets, uh, there's a table which is defining the different parameters like your moisture, mm-hmm. so, uh, moisture uh, values and uh, each category, there's a particular value for that. Mm-hmm. So when you are defining this uh, building structures, everything using uh, mm-hmm. like uh, Google Maps and all, how those things are addressed? Uh, I'm not sure this question is correct also. but no, uh, It is a correct question. Mind. And it is so basically it is a translation of data to a model specific parameter. So uh, yeah. Uh, if you look at our recent paper, uh, and uh, you can send me an email, I'm just putting my email in the chat, that has some idea about how the translation is being done. 
and i'm also yes. um, on linkedin uh, so if you look me up on linkedin i'm following you sir yeah so you can definitely send me an email or a message sure. there and i can send you some more information associated with that yeah but it's a good question Thank it is you, not sir. a straightforward aspect but uh, it can be very easily done by either replicate using what somebody else has done or it can be done in a little bit more evolved manner by localizing those pa uh, parameters based on your local knowledge thank you sir sure had a great time thank you uh the presentation should be available uh, as uh, sir mentioned uh, on the IEEE GRS's website yeah but once again i thank thank everyone for um, for your engagement here and uh, look forward to working with several of you if you have any interest our group is very collaborative and uh, Saurabh and I we have been going to do some new work Saurabh is editing a book on this topic you should be hearing about it soon when he has finalized that a bit more yes indeed. and we'll catch up more all right thank you thank so you much, Dave thank you everyone uh, bye thanks